of the Aftermath podcast, and our special guest today is Leanne Kanzler, who's coming to us all the way from the land down under. So we're really excited to hear what she has to say. And of course, our legislative tiger, Kendra, is here as well, my awesome co-host. So both of us have some questions for Leanne. Now, Leanne's got a background that we're really interested in having on the show. She is a psychologist, a coach, a TEDx speaker, and number one best-selling author. So with that as a background introduction, thank you for coming on the show. We appreciate the time and you can spend with us today. Thank you so much. I'm really excited to be here. Um, I just feel like I should mention that there is some internet issues. So if I'm quiet, that means I'm waiting for you guys to keep talking. <laughs> it's not that I'm ignoring you. Um, it's fantastic being here. I love talking about how we can come together to help people going through a crisis after divorce. It's a very common thing and there are way too many people, particularly men, who go through it on their own. So I think podcasts like these and others like yours are fantastic. Well, thank you. And as Mick mentioned, um, we are in the US. Mick is in California. I am in Ohio. And our guest is actually in Australia. So when we say down under, we truly mean down under. So I think what's interesting with this, and you know, you can chime in and, and please feel free to talk just about how difficult this is, but it's a worldwide problem. And I think it's for people that have kids and don't have kids that are going through a divorce. Absolutely. Uh, I actually have had messages from people in Dubai, India, Pakistan, America, Australia, of course. Um, so, and the, the problems are different, you know, in that sometimes it's cultural issues that are really causing them a lot of hurt and pain. Mm -hmm. And they're the same in that there's a lot of grief, a lot of confusion, a lot of I don't know how I'm ever going to get my life back again. I can't afford to, you know, survive. Uh, legal stuff, parenting, all of that is similar worldwide. Uh, and it's really fascinating also to see the differences in the legal system around the world. And um, as an Aussie, pretty much the legals are very similar state to state, but I've learned how different they are in America, which fascinates me. <laughs> yeah. And I, that I think they're worse in America. <laughs> and yeah. I'd like to follow up on that if I might now see I'm curious if there is something in common in terms of the English Commonwealth or the countries that were English speaking or colonies at one time mm -hmm. is there a similarity between let's say Australia New Zealand Canada and what have you because they were all part of the Commonwealth and then do you find differences with other legal systems and psychological systems perhaps in other parts of the world Okay, so you froze then, but I think similarities between Australia and other parts of the world in terms of divorce? Yes. Yes, yes. okay, thank you. Um, yes, definitely. Some of the similarities are the way that people actually handle the situation. Um, they take it to extreme levels in terms of uh, control and abuse and or the opposite of really feeling like they have no control and they, they allow their partner to walk over them and they kind of give up on asking for what they actually deserve. Um, there's a lot of similarities with parent alienation. Uh, this is actually worldwide, doesn't matter where they are, where the child more often than not ends up with the mother and the, the father doesn't get to see the children. Um, that often doesn't happen all the time, but when it does, it's, it's similar worldwide, the parent alienation issue. Have a lot of dads talk to me about that and it's really quite distressing for them. And um, it's a blessing that I'm able to help them get through that and make better choices for themselves to, to help that situation. Um, even just the expenses of legals and that can be really scary for a lot of people going through that situation and... Um, it's good that I can talk to them and, you know, give them some advice on how to manage that and go through it a bit quicker rather than toing and froing and using their solicitor or lawyer as a um, counsellor because that's not what they're there for. And, and that can really be helpful as well. 
Leanne, I know that we are just meeting, but I am actually a mom of parental alienation. So I haven't mm -hmm. seen my oldest in about four years or had any contact and my youngest in about a year and a half. So my boys are 15 and 11 and mm -hmm. Mick can tell his side of the story, but he also comes from alienation. Yes, my child was very young between ages of five and eight. And that's why I wrote this novel, because I was trying to tell people a story that you just can't believe it's true, but all these crazy, wild, bizarre things are true. But this is what I found. The percentage seems to be higher for men, but as Kendra has indicated herself, and I know women also who have been part mm. of alienation. So that's why I think it, it's not necessarily one over the other. It's just it can happen to anybody. Yeah, definitely. I've definitely seen it in both ways and it's it's really quite devastating and I'm really sorry to hear that, that you've been through that, Kendra. Um, you know, parents who do that to their exes, I don't know what they get out of it, some sort of keep or power play, control play, but really it's very damaging to the alienated parent and to the children. It's so damaging to the children not to have their mum or their dad in their life and, um, you know, Kendra, I, as you said, I don't know you, but I get a really good vibe from you and I can assume that you would be a, a beautiful mum. And it's sad that your kids don't get to spend that time with you. Thank Often you. what happens is kids come to their own conclusion when they're a little bit older and they realise that, oh, all this stuff my parent has said to me about my other parent is actually lies and they come back but that doesn't make up for all the lost time that you've had already. Yes. Yes. True. So um, Mick comes from a very hard um, separation. I don't know what to call it, Mick. His story is very unique. Um, and, uh, you know, with me, with going through a divorce and um, an affair on the other side of things and also losing the children, and I know for many of our listeners, it can be so hurtful, no matter what your story is coming out of separation or divorce. How do people start to heal? How do they find themselves again? What advice would you give them? Hmm. This may sound a little bit um, cliched or basic, but the biggest thing I've found is when people actually start doing things for themselves. And it can just be simple things like going back to the gym or reconnecting with family and friends. Often when we're going through a difficult separation or marriage or just a relationship, we um, withdraw or what's going on with our partner, our partner kind of alienates us, tells us that our family is no good for us or our friends are no good for us and so we step away from our support networks. So finding those support people is extremely important into getting back into finding yourself. And sometimes that means an apology, an explanation, a, um, you know, I didn't mean to hurt you. I didn't mean to push you out of my life. This is what was going on for me. Can we have a coffee and reconnect again? And that can be with family. I've had lots of clients who have really had to dig deep and, really be honest about what's going on so that they can reconnect to their, their support network. And that's hmm. be mindful of not diving into drugs and alcohol as support because that just actually longs the problem. It makes it harder for your children to be with you. Uh, it gives your ex an excuse not to have your children with you. And it actually makes the grief longer because you're not giving your body and your emotional system time to process the emotion of the grief. So people who turn to drugs and alcohol actually give themselves a much harder time. And sometimes we just need to sit in the corner and have a good cry. Um, and sometimes a shower is a great place to just jump in the shower and just allow all of those emotions to wash through you. Um, really doing things for yourself that might mean changing your job, having a massive house clean out, moving house, whatever it means, something that you are really doing for yourself because you want to, not because somebody else is telling you you have to. I know Kendra has some other questions, but I was curious again, looking over your site as she did, that there are certain things that you have there about narcissism, about depression, and some other things. So I'm wondering if you could 
provide some guidance for people who are thinking of becoming closer to someone or if they're in a relationship and what extent these factors will play into it, things that a person might be struggling with, narcissism and depression and other things that are mental health issues? Mm, Wow, that's a huge question. We could talk about that all day. It's very hard when you start dating someone to detect if they're a narcissist because narcissists, are they have this kind of sales process where they will be absolutely amazing and they will figure out what you want and they will absolutely give it to you. So sometimes when people talk to me about that, because obviously I see clients after their breakup and they're now dating someone else, be careful there i want you to really be aware and trust your gut leanne i'm gonna interrupt just for a second you your audio and video kind of froze can you say again what you were saying oh yes of course sorry yes so um you usually see people after they break up with them and starting to date somebody new that's where you were at great thank you and Often they'll say, I've met this person and they're absolutely amazing and they give me all this stuff and then they go, oh, but there's just something. And I say, trust that something because that something can be the narcissist. You have to absolutely trust your gut. Never, ever, ever ignore that just something Um, because the narcissist will just play right over that and win your heart again and then you will be in another world of grief. So it's very important to trust yourself when in the beginning of a relationship, even if you don't know what that niggle is. That niggle might be something that you need to work on for yourself, so lack of trust because of what happened to you with your ex or something that happened in your childhood or with your parents or whatever it might be. Whatever that niggle is, highly recommend that you talk to someone about it. Friends, if they're wise, not friends if they're likely just to give you terrible advice um, or a therapist or a professional person to just sit down. You may just need one session to go, all right, I need to hash this out with someone who's not a friend or family member. I need you to help me figure out if I'm on track or not. And um, if you have been unfortunate enough to be in a relationship with a narcissist or in domestic violence, it's very important to Get professional help for that if you can because that will absolutely play out um, in a trauma response with future relationships and with you. And uh, depression is is a big part of that. You know, I went through a very controlling relationship for 17 years, which is what led me to this space where I was uh, told on a very regular basis, you know, one minute I was amazing and gorgeous and this and that, and then the next I was like the worst person in the world and nothing I could do was right and it was horrible and I did anything I could to try and please him because I had no clue about who I was. You know, I was very young. I was only 20 when I got married um, and now I'm like, oh, my God, why did I put up with that? <laughs> uh, I can, I'm, I'm grateful to my younger self because she's taught me a lot but I made lots of mistakes. Yes. We, as long as we're learning, we're growing, right? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Mick, did you have anything else around depression or anything that you wanted to address? Not specifically, but I, I think what you're saying is you're right. It's a, it's a huge topic. And so you've got a quiz and you got other things on the website would be really helpful. And yeah. again, I got to reflect a little bit because yes, I got that, what some people call a love bombing, you know, with mm-hmm. my wife. And it's like, well, she was amazing. She did everything for me. But I also realized over a period of time, as I described it, there's a string attached, which you don't necessarily see at the time. But everything that was done for you yeah. meant that at some point there's going to be, well, now you, have, you owe me. And that's something that just takes a while to unpack and unfold and, and recognize for yourself. Yes, for sure. And that, that love bombing, it never lasts. It never lasts. This is why people should never, ever move in together too soon in a relationship because you don't really know someone until at least, at least one year in. Mm. People will change, you know. Um, I would always recommend at least 18 months, two years before you move in with somebody. That's just me. Um, That's great advice. That is great advice because I think some people think, oh, six months, 
we're okay and we're going to save money and move in together eight months or so it's very yeah. interesting that you recommend 18 months yeah and the reason of saving money is never a good reason to move in with someone because that's not that's not from the heart that's that's a head oh we'll save money <laughs> you need to get to know somebody fully especially if there's kids oh my god i'd never recommend moving in with someone with children before the two-year period really because we change so much and that that impacts our kids um, and i just wanted to mention mickey mentioned about i have do have on my website the narcissism assessment there's 110 questions they're just true or false you can whip through them and um, you can just kind of figure out if my partner is a narcissist and all of us can answer some of those questions so if you answer like 10 or 15 as a yes that's not an issue because the three of us would answer some of them as a yes but if you have like 80 or 90 questions, then you're in trouble. So I guess touch on that a little bit more if you can, Leanne, is if a narcissist, all of us have narcissistic, narcissistic tendencies, right? But we're not yes. a full-blown narcissist. Can you explain the levels or, or what that looks like? Um, yeah, well, we all, you know, narcissism, the term came from um, uh, uh I'm having a mind blank. Basically, it's about us doing things for ourselves and, you know, feeling really good about who we are and all of that sort of stuff. And a lot of people are labelled a narcissist when they're not. And this is something that actually does cause problems and frustrates me a little bit because people who have been through a lot of trauma in their lives can sometimes be labelled a narcissist because... They are trying to simply protect themselves in their fear of what's going on. But the reality is a true narcissist is someone who will completely take over your life, have complete disregard for who you are, what you stand for, and everything has to be about them. And they can get very nasty in that as well. And then there's other levels to that, um, you know, the sociopath and psychopath and that sort of stuff as well. So people have to be careful on which label they give their ex-partner. On social media at the moment, there is a lot of talk about narcissism and sometimes I look at things and I think, okay, <laughs> maybe, maybe not. Um, so we have to be careful at, at who we're listening to just because someone's been with a narcissist. So we have to be aware of asking the right people the right questions uh, because what also can happen is people can label their ex-partner a, a narcissist which then somehow takes away from the fact that they've been in a domestic violence relationship mm. and it's easier for people to say, I was with a narcissist than I was in an abusive relationship. And I completely get that. I would not ever say that I was in an abusive relationship for a very long time and even now I don't like to say it um, but really it was um, and there is shame around that you know how could I get myself into that situation and, and that sort of thing but working through and understanding that it's not your fault whether you somehow ended up with an abuser or a narcissist it's not your fault you know they're always good at covering that sort of thing up at the beginning and understanding and loving yourself and giving yourself compassion for, wow, okay, I survived that and now I'm free of that, thank the Lord, and um, moving through it without shame. That's one of the ways that we survive that and we thrive by taking away the blame, the personal blame for ourselves. Taking on more responsibility is a good way of, of looking at it, like, okay, I can see that on a personal perspective, I can see now how I fell into that relationship, how I didn't love myself, how I didn't know. People are like that. You know, they don't really know who they are or what they want in a relationship, and that's what can lead to problems later on. Wow, lots of great nuggets there. I was trying to take some quick notes. <laughs> <laughs> I think us Aussies can talk fast too, can't we? <laughs> I love that you say um, you survived it because I think sometimes what we experience, we don't um, include that it's such 
a trauma to us, right? And I think using the word survived makes it seem surreal. It really was trauma that we experienced. I mean, Mick went through some, you know, horrible trauma with his daughter and wife at the time. And um, I just think taking a breath and saying we survived it is surreal. Yeah. Too many people have been through it, haven't they? Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I went through suicidal periods as well. Um, that's kind of what really led me to go, I, I can't, I can't be in this relationship. It's literally killing me. I, I'm fantasizing about driving into a truck. This is not helpful. Um, yeah. And no one knew I didn't tell anyone. Yeah. I love that you've turned your mess into blessing others though. I absolutely love that you transition that way. And I think that's healthy as well. Mm, thank you. Yes. Yeah. Yes. You know, I think it was all of that that led me to actually go back to psychology. I started my degree when I was 30. Uh, I left uni when I was 19. I just did the first year and then I left to get married at 20. Um, and then he kept telling me there was something wrong with me. So I went to a psychologist and I came home from one session and said, I'm going back to uni and I'm going to study. And he was really pissed off about that. <laughs> Good for me, you. Yeah, he wanted me to come home and tell him that I was all messed up and it was all my fault. <laughs> it didn't pan out that way. <laughs> I, earlier. There was something missing for me in that, so that's when I started to do um, coaching. And I think psychology and coaching together is amazing. I love it. And um, with coaching, you know, they talk about, about, well, who is your ideal client? Who do you really want to work with? And that's what led to working with divorcees and particularly men is what I started out with because I think men don't get enough support in this space at all. Kendra had said earlier about there was some references, the differences, men and women, so it's men power, women power, whatever it might be. Could you address that? I think that's a really interesting area to explore a little bit. Hmm. Yeah, so I've got these two programs. Um, it started off that I just worked with men. So I, I created a program just for men. And in that there's a, things like the male depression scale and I talk to dads about different things and um, how to parent. And so each I have modules. So each module there is a separate section for dads as well. And the language is geared towards men and it's it's really about helping men understand that they're being heard and listened to. And after a few months, I realised that I actually love working with women as well. So uh, I actually got invited to be part of a women's magazine called Feminescence. And I thought, well, if I'm going to be in a women's magazine, I really need to show that I'm working for with women too. And so I <laughs> programmed so that it would also be more female-centred and um, then addressing mums and stuff they might be experiencing. And um, so it's a very similar program, but one is focused towards men and one is focused towards women. And um, I've had some really beautiful comments and results from that. And I think people can appreciate that, you know, men and women do think differently and they do respond to divorce differently. And it's important to recognize that rather than just having one program for everybody. And um, I think the program can also suit people in um, gay relationships. You know, it doesn't really matter how you identify the program. is really about our heart and what we need to do to reclaim ourselves and how to handle our ex-partner in a way that helps us and not hinders us and how to help our children as well. So it really makes no difference um, what gender you are or you know how you describe yourself. It's really about the individual person, as a person. I think the modular is very unique and I've never seen a counselor, psychologist, therapist have anything like this in America. Mm -hmm. So I was very intrigued by this. I thought one of the things that you put on there um, was 30 and above. 
And I wanted you to kind of just address that. Is it because you think younger might not be as mature enough to understand all of the issues or, or, or do you, you know, I was just curious. I'm so sorry. Can you, can you repeat that? The, um, the links froze again. Yes, yes, yes. No problem. So in your women power program, you note that it's 30 plus on age. Oh, and I was just curious as to why you said that. Is it because of maturity? Is it because of life experiences? What would that be like? Um, younger people definitely think a little bit differently, you know, that generation. Um, I wouldn't exclude them. I'd probably have a chat to them first and see where they're at. And younger people these days don't tend to marry as early as what they did back in my day. Feeling very old. <laughs> <laughs> you are not that old. <laughs> <laughs> old enough. Um, old enough to now have children in, in the 20 age group. And um, I just, yeah, I do feel that it's, it's, it's what I do is better suited for older people because they think differently and I think differently. And, and I connect better to people over 30. You know, I have to just own that. I'm not great with connecting to younger people on that sort of level. I do work with younger people. Um, as a psychologist, of course, um, but I find that older people connect to me and I connect to them. Therefore, the therapeutic relationship is a lot better. Yeah, we all have to have our specialties. That makes sense. And I like some of the modulars that you had in there where you and you mentioned briefly about this, but your and I, I think maybe I froze or you froze. So hopefully you can still hear me. I know since we're going from the US to Australia, it can be a challenge. Hope we didn't lose Lene completely. Yeah, oh no, and we did. did. She's back. I'm back. I'm so You're sorry. Oh, that was fast. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. I live in this bizarre place outside of Sydney where if a plane flies past, which seems to be happening a bit today, the internet drops out. It's ridiculous. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Well, I'm glad you were able to click back in really quick. <laughs> so I was saying you have the different modulars and I really like, and you briefly mentioned before a couple of them, but how you work with not just finding yourself and healing after divorce, but your relationship with your kids and how to mend that and moving forward through the divorce and then how to be a better co-parent, have a relationship with your ex, and then even how to be a step-parent. And I thought those were all very good things. It's very unique to what you do. And mm -hmm. we don't see a whole lot of that with therapists or psychologists, at least I haven't, in America. So I think that's very unique. There's, you know, going through a divorce and moving on is an absolute minefield. There is so much stuff to work through. And I felt it was really, really important to address all of them, even if it's just a little bit here and a little bit there, to really help people think, okay, how am I going to navigate this in a way that is going to be beneficial for me and my children and even my ex? You know, we still love this person at some point. And I'm very, very passionate about children and their well-being. And uh, I really actually at the beginning wanted to work with children, but I found I got very emotional about it, so I, I stopped doing that. Hmm. And then working with parents through a divorce because if parents are in a good headspace, they'll make far better decisions for themselves and for the kids. And for some reason what's happened is a lot of parents put their children's needs right here and their own needs way down here and what that can lead to is children feeling like they have no boundaries they don't know where they stand they're the boss in the relationship I get everything I want and mom and dad don't and that is really not healthy for anybody in the family so I do a lot of talking to my clients when I see them individually and there's some in the program as well but I do one-to-one -one work as well where I really talk to them about that. You know, who's, in, who's the boss in your family? Is it your child who is a child? They should not be the parent. Or is it you? And I help them work through that. And I help them um, navigate the emotions of their children and their stepchildren. And um, 
if they're separating and then they're not going to get to see their stepchildren again, there's a lot of grief around that. And I think it's really important that parents are um, acknowledged for all of these, these different nuances of a breakup. It's so intricate, you know, what people go through. And, you know, my heart goes out to them, which I guess is why I'm doing this work because it's, it's amazing to see someone come in feeling absolutely hopeless to get through this and walk out with some, some sense of hope and, okay, I've got a plan, I'm going to do this into place, I know how to deal with my kids or my stepkids now, let's see what happens. I'm like, yes, you can do it. And um, that's why I do this. Wonderful. So do you work with anybody in the U.S.? Have you? Oh, um, yeah. Okay. Can you tell us okay. about that and how people can reach out and contact you or get a hold of you? Uh, well, I have the website, which is simply www.leannekansler.com. Uh, they can send me an email to leanne at leannekansler.com. Because of the time difference, sometimes it's easier to send me an email uh, because my uh, acuity calendar doesn't really have the different time zones in there uh, because I still see psychology clients. So I don't have a, a, a lot of availability on my acuity calendar, but I'm more flexible than my calendar shows. So um, it's a lot easier to just flip me an email and then I can go, right, what time zone are you in? Just like we did. And um, let's make this work. Um, and that, that seems to work quite well, actually. So I love working with people from around the world. It just really is a massive eye-opener, and I get to learn a lot. I learn so much from each of my clients. Um, I am never, ever not going to learn, and that's why this job is so empowering because, you know, we all get to Sorry, must have been another plane. <laughs> Yeah, I can hear it. Oh my God, these planes are killing me today. <laughs> we lost just the last part there, what you said. Oh, just that um, we all learn so much from our clients every day. And I never, ever say that I know it all because once you say you know it all, you actually stop learning. And um, there's so much to learn in this space. It's, it's a continuing journey. And I really love to help my clients learn more about themselves as well. Well, I've learned a lot from you today. I don't know about you, Mick. Uh, I learned a lot. I'm going to have to listen to this and try to make notes. Uh, you're fortunate to make the notes. I'm going to go back and the whole thing, lots of wisdom and lots of information. So I really appreciate oh, wow. it. That's great. I'm really glad. I'm going to listen to it as well. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you very much for joining us today and sharing your wisdom with our audience. And if they want to get a hold of you, we'll also have your website and your email in the show notes. And um, I just want to say thank you for joining us from Australia down under. Thank you so much. And thank you for putting up with my internet issues today. <laughs> <laughs> it just happens. But just as a reminder, thank you, Leanne. It was appreciated all the time and the information that you provided for us. And if for our listeners, of course, please get a hold of us at the aftermathhealing at gmail.com. And if you like the show, we hope you do listen, subscribe, share, positively review on Apple. It really helps a lot to keep these shows coming. So thanks again, both Kendra and Leanne. We appreciate your time. Until next time, we'll see you. Day is full. <laughs>